December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. 2,200 American servicemen were killed. Japan and the U.S. were at war. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, decided that all Japanese and Americans of Japanese descent were a threat to national security. So he rounded up all Japanese Americans living on the West Coast. Even American citizens of Japanese descent were taken from their homes. Small children were yanked from their schools. Their parents separated from established businesses. Today, we recognize this act as a hysterical overreaction to war. But for three years during the Second World War, life in relocation camps was a reality for Japanese Americans. In 1944, workers of Japanese descent began to trickle into Seabrook. The second largest group at Seabrook were the Estonians. In addition to these groups, there were Poles, Jamaicans, Lithuanians, Latvians, Germans, Hungarians, Czechoslovakians, and Yugoslavians. Deported Peruvians also worked at Seabrook, and German prisoners of war were bussed in daily. Many questioned if this diverse collection of cultures, this tossed salad, would survive in the soil of Seabrook. Let's find out firsthand from those who formed the population of Seabrook. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Watsonville, California, and my parents were farmers, and uh, we grew uh, uh, strawberry and uh, lettuce farming. Yes. I was born in Jamaica, and uh, my family had parents were beautiful, but they passed when I was a kid. And that's one of the things that uh, has prompted me to come to America. And my mother is uh, from Tokyo. Uh, after my father finished high school in Kyoto, um, he decided to move to Lima, Peru, where uh, one of his uncles had started a sporting good business. Uh, this is the picture of my hometown. In Estonia, yes. and I was a teacher in Viljandi, in the same town. My life prior to World War II was very carefree, and uh, I grew up in Central California, um, where I uh, spent my early childhood until evacuation with uh, friends who were Caucasian and uh, had a good time going to school. I was born in the Ukraine and um, when the war had started we left uh, for Germany but we couldn't go direct to Germany so we lived in uh, camps for three years and 45 when the Russians came closer then we moved into West Germany. Just so my family, Warden family. <laughs> Just right. Can I interject something on that? We call it the uh, Walton picture because then this is way out on the farm and we're poor. And uh, this is in 1935 when this picture was taken. And it's our whole group. And you could tell by <laughs> looking at us that we're country bumpkins. Because we were a small family and a group, we got along well together. So that's our Walton family picture. But yes, that's all in my family. And this is a family now. Went to school first <laughs> and graduated from high school and graduated from university and then I was, I was a lawyer you at were... home. And the uh, last five years I was a uh, mayor of the city, of the same city. I was born in Salinas, California and I lived there until the war started. In April they told us, they gave us I think a week or so to get ready to leave. And we had to sell everything we had, close up everything, and leave. I, I sort of remember because uh, uh, it wasn't too long after war started, the FBI came and took my father away from us and they sent him to uh, New Mexico uh, for simply being a kendo instructor. They took him away from us. And then the rest of our family, we went to po uh, uh, an assembly center, and then we went to Poston, Arizona. We fled. Otherwise, 
I would have been in Siberia, maybe I haven't been dead. Because, because the uh, Russians, when they came in, they came in, for, in, 19, in 1940, 40. they deported, in the first time, they deported over 40,000 people in one night. So when they came, knocked at your door and said, you have time, 10 minutes or, or 20 minutes, and pack whatever you can and go. The individuals who were married were put on board a train and ended up in um, uh, Kennedy internment camp in Crystal City, Texas. And that's where my, uh, my, my father was interned. Uh, meanwhile, my, uh, my mother, brother, and sister had no knowledge of uh, what had happened to my father. And needless to say, uh, they were quite concerned and worried, uh, wondering whether or not they would ever see him again. She really had two options, one of which was to wait for his return, which was uncertain, uh, and the other option was that uh, the U.S. government was going to be providing another ship to bring the families who had been left behind to join the, uh, the, the husbands in the camp. And so my uh, mother chose to do the latter. Uh, uh, I would think they were allowed, uh, each allowed two suitcases. He was eight years old. and. Uh we were there for three years and 45. We just made it, as the Russians pushed, we just made it out of town when he came into town the other end. And uh, 45, we, we arrived in West Germany, in Kassel. And we lived there until 52. And then the opportunity arose to come to the United States. And my father had planned uh, to go to come to the United States in 1929. But, uh, they killed the American consulate and everything was stopped. So uh, when they took him away one o'clock at night in 1938, he called to my mother and he said, follow my dream if you have a chance. So she always had the ambition to come to the United States. I should also say that uh, when we were interned, that meant that we needed to first go to an assembly center in Fresno, which was 50 miles north of Tulare. I came here in uh, 49, uh, but we left our country in 1944. I see. So we were in the meantime in Germany, in displaced persons camps. When I was uh, inducted, uh, my family was still living in the same apartment. My brother was working, and he was supporting the family at that time. And uh, about two months after I, I was taking basic training, I received a letter from my brother saying that they were being evacuated. And, uh, and actually, I didn't know where they were going, but uh, he kept writing and told me that uh, they went to Pialup Fairgrounds and they were put in horse stalls, and uh, that was a shame. But uh, finally, they went to uh, a camp in Minidoka, Idaho, and uh, they were interned there. So when uh, we found out that uh, we were to go to Arkansas, we immediately told everybody that that was our destination for the duration. And little did we know where Arkansas was even located. For me, at that point, it was the loneliest trip the loneliest journey of my life. My only consolation was, one night, I peeked out of the shade and I saw the Milky Way in the sky. The Milky Way, the same Milky Way that I was familiar with was following me and my family to this destination called Arkansas. So I was immediately uplifted in spirit, and I felt that someday we will be vindicated. Mr. Seabrook approached the federal government for, uh, with a request that they put up wartime housing to take care of these families that he was having come to live here and work at the factory. A big day came when Mr. Charles Franklin Seabrook sent people to 
Arkansas to tell us about how about coming to Seabrook. And uh, there was this invitation for three of us, myself as Ellen Noguchi and uh, Mayor Fuju Sasaki and uh, another uh, person from Northern California, Harold Ochida. We became the delegation to come to Seabrook on a tax task finding mission. And it was really the turning point of my life. Well, when the quota was opened, you had to have a sponsor. And Mr. Seabrook sponsored for us. And it was like a miracle because they only sponsored when there was a father. We didn't have a father. And my grandmother, she was, uh, she had a stroke. And my brother was only 14 and I was sick at the time. And my mother, she thought, we don't have a prayer, but I tried. And she made it. In Jamaica, I did not hear the name Seabrook. But there was a crude recruiting going on. It was arranged between the U.S. government and the Jamaican government for the U.S. government to recruit workers to come to work in the United States. And I wanted to come, and I got lucky enough to be picked to come. And I didn't hear about Seabrook until when I got to Houston Station. Yeah, if Mr. Out. Seabrooks wouldn't have sponsored for us, I think we would have had to stay in Germany. But my mother, she uh, she was so determined to come to the United States because that was my father's wish to begin with. And uh, she was so afraid uh, to fall into the Russians because uh, my father, he had four brothers and one sister. And the whole family was wiped out. They all were taken to Siberia and they all wiped out. It's just uh, my mother and us who slept. She said, I'm not, no matter what, I have a chance to leave. They uh, uh, called a meeting, uh, and uh, when he went to the meeting, there was this man, I think his name was Mr. Letts, I'm not sure, and told, told uh, them about uh, uh, Seabrook Farms, and that uh, they were there to uh, recruit uh, uh, workers, and so, uh, after the meeting uh, and after what uh, they were told what, what it was and where it was, my father came home and he said uh, he had an opportunity to go back to uh, California and do farming. And uh, we decided in early age, my sis older sister and I, that we weren't ever going to go back and be a farmer and a farmer's wife. <laughs> Because you know, it's working from sundown to, you know, uh, sun up to sundown. And so when my dad said, he says, it's equally important as to how you girls feel about us relocating elsewhere. So he says, I'll take a vote. And he said, those of you who wants to go back to California and farm, raise your hand. Well, none of us did. And so then he said, those of you who want to go to Seabrook and, and try a new thing, he said, raise your hand. So we all raised our hand. And so that's how we decided Seabrook it was going to be. And I'll never regret coming here. I think uh, this has really uh, been a wonderful place for us and our family. I always feel very grateful that Mr. Seabrook did undertake to do this for us. I think uh, that was really a good thing. Mm -hmm. Claire Pastor was the yeah. heretic, and they both organized together with the permission of Mr. Seabrook that uh, our people started to come here. And the first of Estoni Estonians who came here when, uh, was in March 49 one or two families. And then we came here on the 14th of May. I, I clearly know, and I, Mr. Palmer writes in his book too about that. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Oh, we lived in the barracks. Yes, very nice housing, but it was nice. Mr. Seabrook, he supplied uh, uh, like a little apartment. It was like two little bedrooms and a kitchen. 
it was enough if you had nothing else. It was very good and was heated and uh, blankets and everything because we only came with a suitcase. We had nothing else. But it was nice for the beginning. It was nice. We were happy because we had worse times. I, I must tell you one thing. Uh, we had to stop working at the plant, Seabrook plant. I never, I have never worked in the plant. <clears throat> and I had to start night shift from 6 until 6 in the morning. And after that first day, I thought this is my first and last day here in Seabrook. But I stayed here. We, we didn't have any way of No choice. <clears throat> Our children had to be brought up, so that was the main, main endeavor. So I wasn't old enough to work, so, um, and there was no work right away. We came in March, and the, the farming wasn't ready, and we didn't have no money. We didn't have money to buy a cup of coffee in New York. That is unbelievable. So, uh, when we arrived, they gave us uh, supper. Seabrooks and Community Hall, and the next morning, Mr. Seabrooks, he came and he gave everyone $10 to go shopping. We went shopping, and uh, then we had to wait until the plant opened. And uh, I wasn't old enough to work, so every day, oh, and there was no work in the plant, in the fields to pull weeds and pick asparagus. So every day a lady would stay home and give me her card and I would go to work. This way I had a full week of work. And one day the foreman, he says, what is this? You have a different name every day? Then we explained and he said, okay. <laughs> but I had to help my mother that way. Yeah. Because they put in long hours, no. you know. Lunch is a lot of work. Yeah. They all... The, uh, or packing, they all lined up side by side. Yeah. And they, they were Caucasians and they were uh, black. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were black workers too. Yeah. Yeah, she says she they got al they got along in the uh, broken in her broken English, I guess, you know. <laughs> they made out. Oh, I recall in the early days when we had the, the recreation center here at the, the Seabrook and, and we had the Boy Scouts and my son was part of the, of the, of the, uh, the Cub Scouts and, and involving all this whole thing of just a one family group of people that we enjoyed and to be together. We had gangs here, but it's a whole different thing. You know, we, they all had the jackets, um, we all had um, certain things that distinguished us as a member of a certain group in, within the community, but it was all very positive. And, um, you know, even today, you'll hear people talking and they'll say, wasn't he a rainbow or was he a uh, blue devil? And everybody knows uh, what they mean and it was just a very safe place to grow up. One thing that we did have in Seabrook was the community house and at that community house they had all the uh, recreation available for us there. We had our basketball team, basketball team, uh, baseball team. They had the pool hall and everything right there for the library, a little cafeteria. Because cultural life was always part of the Estonian groups outside uh, their homeland, because this way I think we were able also to, to keep the spirit alive. And uh, we had a fairly good choir here, which was organized before my, my time, before I came here. And uh, the leader of the choir was Maimo Mido. Then at the same time, same time, we founded our church, Britain Church. Then, pretty soon, pretty soon, we found it in a folk dance group. You saw the picture somewhere, yeah? You, had, you saw the picture. Yeah. High school. Yeah. And 
we had a choir. We had a choir, 65 people. Taiko Group is a drumming group that we have in Seabrook. It is authentic Japanese drumming that, with the equipment that we make to make it look authentic Japanese. Luckily, we have a person that uh, is so very handy with equipment and tools that uh, he was the one that finished off our drums. My mother has always uh, been interested in doing various crafts. So she taught me how to fold paper, probably to get me out of her hair um, when I was about four. But I essentially started from origami and then I do Japanese embroidery. It's interesting because my sisters who couldn't do any other crafts are now interested and I have, you know, my mother taught me, I taught my sister, my sister taught her daughter. So now we have three generations who work with Japanese crafts. Well, uh, Mio dance is uh, actually uh, authentic Japanese folk dancing. We were very fortunate to uh, have Mr. Matsuda, who was a Mio, uh, well, uh, master, come to Japan once a year and give us lesson, uh, three days of uh, real good lessons. And after he left, I would take over. But we still have good, strong, we'll say about 16 girls that uh, are still dancing strongly. And, uh, we've been going to many schools and many uh, civic groups to further our culture. And not only furthering it, but we teach. You know, I usually, at the end, teach them several Dances, so they could join in in the folk dancing. Yeah, see, it, in her t time when she came, there wasn't anybody that took uh, citizen, you know. Shibuloko ni kite. Shibuloko ni kita wa mo American Union no tataki na kite to 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 applying for citizenship until they came here. Then the American, you know, the Legion, they're the one that uh, made uh, it possible for them to be, uh, become citizens. I feel a little humble in talking about this because I was, I don't think, uh, I was just a little girl then and I wasn't involved. But uh, from what I understand, uh, in 1953, the Walter McCarran Naturalization and Immigration Act was passed, and that was largely because of the efforts of the National JACL at that time through Mike Masaoka. Uh, as far as its effects in Seabrook, it enabled many of the people in Seabrook who were not citizens at the time to uh, obtain citizenship. And again, the community got together, the American Legion in Bridgeton, under the leadership of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Brower, uh, were involved in helping teach the um, teach basics and, you know, um, had classes, they had classes uh, that helped people um, in getting their citizenship. And in 1953, 100, 127 persons from Seabrook were naturalized. And it was um, all done in one ceremony. JCL continues to traditionally um, sponsor many activities, one being the annual chow mein dinner, which is, uh, has gone on for over 40 years and is a main, main fundraising activity. So uh, there's usually a nice flower exhibit with that dinner that's, um, that's headed by um, Mariko Ono and that's in part of our culture that we've been able to promote. We have a um, annual picnic that is a, a great fun for everybody. There is also the Kato Kai, or the Senior Citizen um, Appreciation Appreciation Dinner. The JCL has been very important in um, 
in bringing up the issue of redress for Japanese Americans. Would I credit Seabrook for anything in my life? Mm -hmm. I would say that everything that has happened now is directly connected with Seabrook. That's my first start in life, my first work experience. And from then, it was good then, and even today, it's all an integral part of Seabrook. Seabrook to me is like a second home. He knew everybody, and he always came into the plant, regardless of what hour of day it was. And uh, uh, his sons were very much the same. And the mere fact that he would he would come to your home, he would, he would call on you sometime, and make you feel that you're you're needed, and you're wanted as part of the of the family. We called it a family, even though we're, there were hundreds of us. Uh, uh, my impression of Mr. Seabrooks was a very nice man, and he was uh, how shall I say? Uh, he had a good heart. He did help people when they came here in every way. That's. That's what I was young, but that was my feeling. And now when I look back, I can see that he had a good heart and I was trying to help everyone. And he did. Yes, I did know Mr. Seabrook personally. He used to call me the girl with a red face. And he was a, a fantastic man. He was a little man, but he had a lot of noodles. And uh, he did a lot for us. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be where we are. So we're very grateful to him and his family. And my impression of Mr. Seabrook then and now, he is one of the finest persons you could ever meet. The way he treated people, you wouldn't think he's a big Mr. Seabrook. He treated you like a person, a real person, and he's a wonderful person, and I'll never forget him. Everybody was more like one family. If there was an event, everybody was invited. It was not uh, just the Germans or just the Polish. Everybody was invited. And even now, when you meet, it's, uh, you don't see no difference. They're all like family. They're all hugging, nice to, glad to see you. I used to marvel because you would go outside and there would be kids talking in Japanese, talking to a kid who's talking in German and another one who's using Spanish. And they all seemed to understand what they were saying, but we really did. We had just, you know, we had the Latvians, the Germans, the Poles. We even had the Mongolians from Mongolia. The mixture of people coming like that, not knowing each other before, it was really a pleasure to see how everybody merged. And uh, you wondered why in the world in the entire world can people just merge like that. You see, each group naturally, you stick to your group, to each his own, his own kind. But it was such a beautiful merge that it was really wonderful. Many times local people referred to Seabrook as the melting pot of New Jersey because we not only had the Japanese Americans, the Estonians, the Latvians, the Germans, but we had uh, people recruited in Jamaica and uh, uh, from the Appalachia and uh, from the South, both black and white. The southern whites got along with the Southern blacks and uh, every uh, one, the local people, got along well with all of their strange and novel neighbors. Brother and father were not depressed like uh, I thought that they would be, but they never, they always made the best advantage of whatever situation they were in. And that was one thing that they had always told us, to make the best of whatever situation you're in and then you shall never uh, regret anything. And so I think maybe that fundamental teaching that they had given to us, even without our knowing that it was a teaching, was a blessing in disguise. I think there's really a common thread. You can look into the histories of most of the families that were represented here in Seabrook, and there are some common themes. Uh, 
uh, and there's a word in Japanese called gaman, which is to endure. Uh, uh, certainly, one's ability to endure hardship, trials, tribulations, uh, prepares one nicely for life. Uh, um, th throughout my youth, whenever there was a very difficult situation, um, I would see my, my mother and father react to this difficult situation, and there was never any panic. Uh, all they did was to work even harder to uh, overcome the, the hardship or the, the, the trial or tribulation. And so this became instilled in, in us, as it did with all the other children, as a, as a virtue or a value. Uh, education was placed uh, first and foremost. This was our, our ticket out of this environment uh, toward a better life. Um, uh, and so we all strove to do as best uh, we possibly could uh, uh, in school. Um, but I think it's just... Uh, I, it's just the fundamental value system that was instilled by our parents and all of us uh, to work as hard as you could, uh, to be as, um, to reach as much of the potential that, uh, that each of us had uh, as we could. Yeah, I quoted a, a Bible verse and said, whatever happens, we have to feel that it's gonna happen for the best. And he said to us over and over, I don't ever want you girls to hold bitterness here, because if you do, one day we're gonna leave here, and you will never be able to go live among your Caucasian people if you hold bitterness here. He says, you know, we'll just say that God is testing us. And so he says, I want you to keep that. So he made fun for us, and and uh, yeah. so, you know, he, he was really the, a person, my dad was a person that really helped us overcome and and it's true it was what he said was true i really didn't uh, appreciate my father until after i graduated from college and to understand that he came to this country without knowing the language and built up a business of his own and you know uh, i can i can say you know i became an officer an executive in a major corporation but I, I didn't own my own business. I didn't have my own capital at risk, you know. Uh, I really admired my father uh, the older I got. Well, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, if they had had a choice, their preference would have been to return to Peru after the, uh, the internment. Um, with that option taken away, they decided that the United States was where they wanted to settle and, and raise their children. And uh, in retrospect, having spoken to them today, uh, they're very grateful and, and happy that they, they made the choice to stay in the United States. Um, uh, they love this country. They, they harbor no uh, anger, uh, surprisingly, or, or bitterness about the experience. Um, uh, this particular episode was an unfortunate episode, but things like this happen, and you can approach it in a couple of ways. You can dwell on it, um, you can feel bad about it, you can be, feel bitter about it, or you can take as, as much advantage of the situation as you possibly can. I think they look at America as, as truly a land of opportunity. And um, if you take a look, I'm, I'm very proud to have come from Seabrook. <clears throat> um, as I see what some of my friends and colleagues and uh, children of uh, my, my parents' peers have done, uh, I'm very proud of, of what, they, what they've done. Many questioned if this tossed salad of inhabitants would survive. They not only survived, they prospered and flourished. Through this cooperative effort, they enriched the history of southern New Jersey.